All right, so um, I'm joined tonight by nine of my incredible library coworkers, and we're here to talk to you about books, which is why you're all here. Um, so the way this will work is that each staff person will share two book titles with you, um, and they'll tell you a little bit about why they're recommending them to you. Um, so all in all, you're gonna have 20 new books to add to your probably already overflowing to be read piles. So you're welcome for that. Um, we're happy to answer your questions or take your comments. Um, so after each staff person is done sharing, um, I'll leave a little bit of space and, and feel free to unmute yourself um, or raise a hand. We'll try to keep an eye. Um, really, it's fine to just unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, or you're welcome to save your questions until the very end if you prefer. And you're also welcome to use the chat. Um, so as I just mentioned, I put the list of books that we're all gonna be talking about. Um, I put the link in the chat. Um, if there's anyone who doesn't see it, let me know. Um, and you know that you can click on that link and go and explore the books further or place them on hold. Um, all right, so with that, um, Anne is gonna kick us off tonight. So Anne, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Book Buzz. Um, okay, so the first book that I'm going to be doing is The Men We Reaped by Jasmine Ward. Um, you may know Jasmine Ward from her novels Salvage the Bones and Sing Unburied Sing, but this book is a memoir about Ward growing up in rural Mississippi. She was born prematurely at only two pounds, and her doctor predicted that she would not live. She survives, of course, and goes on to fight her way to a college education and a successful career as a writer. But this isn't only Ward's story, but also the story of the men she grew up with and what it is like to be a Black man in the modern South. Within a span of five years, five of her closest male friends, including her brother, each die young by suicide or drugs or accidents. Ward began writing this book to figure out why. As she chronicles each friend's life and early death, she teases out common threads of their experience. She highlights how the pressures of growing up surrounded by systemic racism and poverty create an almost impossible situation for these young men to succeed and thrive. I think the power of this book lies in the skilled way that the author personalizes these cultural issues. Her writing honors the beauty and complexity of her friends' lives. And though her grief at the loss of her friends and their potential is woven throughout the book, it is also filled with raucous and tender stories of just being kids and trying to make their way in the world. This book was published in 2013, but remains timely and relevant in our current cultural moment. Okay. And my second book is um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, if you are looking for a book that is an antidote to our turbulent world, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass is a good choice. And not only is it a calming, peaceful read, but it is also a prescription for healing at least some of our modern day issues like climate change and social injustice. This group of essays offers a beautiful, hopeful vision of interdependence, sustainable economics, regenerative agriculture, balance, and shared wealth. I was especially drawn to this book because of the author's unique perspective. She is a biology professor and a Native American who grew up learning the traditional ways of her Potawatomi elder elders. A central theme running through the essays is our relationship with plants, recognizing plants as a gift and our responsibility to give back to them. She approaches these ideas both with her indigenous wisdom, but also with the science to support that wisdom. And it was fascinating to see the intersections between the two. Though it might sound a little woo woo or too sciencey, it is neither. This reads like a memoir and Kimmerer's writing is simple, approachable, and very beautiful. And since it's a collection of essays, this is also a book that you can pick up and put down as you like. You don't have to read it straight through. 
Okay, those are my two recommendations. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Anne. Those sound amazing. Um, all right, next up we have Beth. I'm gonna spotlight you, Beth. Hi everyone, I'm Beth. I'm so happy to be here. Um, during the pandemic, I've had some trouble concentrating. So the two books I selected for tonight are ones that manage to hold my attention. Each have a mystery that keeps you hooked and compels you to read more. Um, but the mystery isn't in the tra traditional detective novel sense. It's that each story has elements of the unknown that are revealed over the course of the narrative. So the first book I'm going to talk about is The Glass Hotel by a Emily St. John Mandel. So this book has intricate interlocking narratives, which makes it a challenge to describe. So I'll start by naming the book's central premise. Life is inconstant and ever changing. Mandel demonstrates this in every storyline. There's a young woman named Vincent. She's beautiful with a tough upbringing. She goes from being a bartender to a rich trophy wife to falling off a container ship in the middle of the night. There's Jonathan Alkaitis, a con artist whose Ponzi scheme causes the collapse of many lives. Jonathan travels from the kingdom of wealth to federal prison, where he's visited by the apparitions of his victims. There's Leon, a shipping executive, who ends up in the world of nomad land, eking out an existence in an RV. The novel jumps around in time, so we do learn these things early on. The magic of Mandel's writing is that she weaves these stories together with beautiful prose. The past, present, material, and spiritual worlds all converge to create a larger picture. And the idea that in life we are susceptible to sudden changes of fortune feels particularly relevant right now. So I didn't have a copy of this book, but the next book I'm gonna talk about is Sea Wife by Amity Gage. Ever wish you could free yourself from the burdens of modern life, the dull job, the endless housework and sail away to a tropical paradise? This is exactly what Michael and Juliet decide to do when they embark on a year long sailing trip with their two young children. Do you hear that and think, what could possibly go wrong? Well, it's not a spoiler to say that something does go terribly wrong. And we learn this right away as Juliet narrates in the present day, which takes place in the aftermath of the journey. While the knowledge that something big goes wrong is the hook of the novel, this is really a story of a marriage. And the things that go wrong in a marriage can be more subtle and gnawing. The confinement of Juliet and Michael to a tiny vessel allows Gage to explore the psychology of this couple. The ocean with its alternating bouts of calm and storm serves as a metaphor for the relationship. They are caught in the squall, both outside and inside of themselves. Their story is even presented in dueling narratives. Juliet's perspective alternates with entries from Michael's logbook, which is like a diary. And this is fitting because I see this book as having two simultaneous storylines. On the surface, it's a seafaring adventure thriller. Below deck, it's an intimate look at romantic relationships. And so the two for one in this book makes for a really great read. All right. Thanks so much, Beth. And I realized that I forgot to give people time if they had any questions. Um, for Anne or Beth. So if you do I, raise your hand. I want to add both of these books were published in 2020. So they're fairly new. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, and so next up we have Dana. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, it's great to see everybody. Um, my first book tonight is Outcasts United. It's a story about a soccer team made up of young refugees that have been resettled to a small town outside of Atlanta, Georgia. 
It's the story of a ragtag bunch of kids and their tough as nails coach. Um, that's basically the cliche, which is, you know, that's a fine story. But when I say ragtag bunch of kids, I mean children who have grown up in war zones, seen violence and death right up close. Um, their tough as nails coach is a young Jordanian woman who decided that she wanted to move to the U.S. so she didn't have to live a life, uh, you know, prescribed as a woman in the Middle East. But doing that led her family to disown her. Um, and so she's living very close to the edge herself. Um, and they're dealing with poverty, these children. Um, they're dealing with racism. And both of those have this veneer of deniability, which I found very interesting. It was, uh, um, as a reader of the novel, I could, the, it's not a, it is a nonfiction book, not a novel, but as I was reading it, I could see the way that people were engaging in racism without realizing it, with um, being able to lie to themselves about it. And it helped me uh, look in the mirror and see some of the ways that I have those same unconscious reactions. I was also very fascinated by Coach Luma. She was strict in a lot of ways that made me a little bit uncomfortable. She would kick boys off her team for not getting a haircut. Uh, she reminded me a lot of Amy Chua, who wrote the Hymn of the Tiger Mother, which some of you may remember. Uh, yeah, your and her high be expectations be are an expression of respect and, and love for these kids, but sometimes you have to ask how high is too high. But on the other hand, she kept kids on her team that were lousy soccer players. Um, and she did that because they followed her rules, they showed up to practice every day, and they were team players. And to me, that's incredibly important. We like to think that youth sports is all about learning teamwork, but the lesson that a lot of people seem to get is that winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. For Coach Luma, she pushes back against that culture. Winning is a side benefit of learning to work as a team. And I think the author Warren St. John did a really good job of getting you to care about these people while keeping the action of the book moving forward. And he includes enough context so that you can see the ways that America is not an innocent bystander in the geopolitical dramas that brought all these children to Georgia. So that's my first recommendation. My second recommendation is a new translation of Beowulf, just so we all have a basis for comparison. Beowulf is an epic poem about a guy named Beowulf, uh, passed down orally for generations, and then written down around the year 1000. It was written down in Old English, but set in Scandinavia in the 500s. Uh, and Old English is not like the difference between modern English and Shakespeare, where you can just get a few footnotes and kind of figure it out. Old English really does need to be translated, which is where uh, Maria Devana Headley comes in. Every translator consciously or unconsciously puts their own viewpoint and their understanding of the world into their work. And Headley is very conscious of it. And she's very upfront about it. Um, reading her introduction of why she did this translation and what she was trying to do with it uh, really aided, added to my enjoyment of the, of the book. Um, and as an example, the, in Old English, the poem starts with the word hoat, H-W-O-E-T, which is one of those words that doesn't have a meaning so much as a function. It's like uh, the teacher flipping the lights off and on in a classroom to get everyone's attention. Um, other translators use words like hark or low, which are good words for saying that a story is about to begin but they also kind of tell you that it's gonna be an old fashioned story and you might as well take a nap. Headley looks at this word and she translates it as bro, which sounds a little silly when I say it and it might even look a little silly when you read it. But if you imagine yourself in a bar and guys are starting to talk about the fights they've been in and these are guys who make fighting part of their identity, it sounds a little bit more natural. I mean, it's a story about kings and knights and their honor, which I don't really care about. 
but I did care about the way the characters in the poem started to think about, well, what makes a good leader? What makes a good man? Toxic masculinity was not part of their vocabulary, but you can see how their adherence to this warrior code really cost them a lot. There's some over-the-top battle sequences that reminded me of Marvel superheroes. There was one that was in an underwater lair. Um, and it was interesting to think about how that kind of entertainment has been a constant from, from societies 1,500 years ago to now. We watch Beowulf grow old and deal with aging. We get a look at motherhood that it's mostly defined by violence. Um, Headley loves playing with language, and her wordplay for me was usually pretty successful, even though there were a few groaningly bad puns. She uses some hypermodern slang like hashtag blessed. Other times she makes up her own archaic sounding portmanteaus. Um, it reminded me a little bit with its mix of history nerd and hip hop stylings. It reminded me a little bit of the musical Hamilton. Um, and I think that this work really gains from out loud kind of energy. Um, it was, you know, originally an oral, orally passed down poem. Um, so if you can, while you're reading it, maybe you read it out loud or you just kind of keep that idea in your head of people sitting around and telling stories. Pull up a seat and grab your favorite beverage and hear about some good adventures. So those are my recommendations. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana. I'm going to start all my stories with bro from now on. <laughs> or Hoyt, I guess that's even cool. That would make me even cooler. <laughs> Either works. <laughs> all right. Um, next up, we have Elizabeth. And I just need to find you in, oh, there you are. <laughs> all right. Hello. So uh, I'm Elizabeth. I have two books to recommend. Um, the first book and one I'm recommending is A Street Cat Named Bob and How He Saved My Life by James Bowen. Um, you may have heard of this book. It was pretty popular um, at one point. Um, but at the time, I misjudged it as just kind of a feel-good cat story, and I wasn't really interested in that. Um, but I picked it up again this summer. Um, sadly, about the time that Bob passed away, um, and I really liked this book. It had a lot more to it than I expected. Um, I started reading it after a conversation with a coworker. We were talking about how people who experience homelessness are depicted in books and media, and I wanted to read this to hear how James Bowen described his experience um, with being homeless. Um, he actually has um, an apartment through most of the story, um, but he still has a real genuine voice to that experience um, and just kind of the fear that kind of never leaves him that that is going to be what he has to return to if he loses his place for one reason or another. Um, however, what I found most intriguing about the book um, was just the responsibility of his taking care of Bob. Um, Bob's a street cat. He kind of chooses James. Street cats, you know, he could have left, but he didn't. He stayed with James, and James had to take on the responsibility of having a cat and taking care of it. He was responsible for um, Bob having a warm place to sleep at night, and he took Bob to the vet. And just the responsibility of having someone else to care for kind of gave James more reason and more energy to keep fighting to get his life together and I found that to be a very genuine experience that taking good care of those around us whether they be human or animal really begins with taking better care of ourselves and that was just a moving message in what was really like easygoing just natural um, genuine voice from the writer so I really enjoyed that one I'm Glad I picked that one up. And my second one is actually a cookbook. Let's see, so it's called The World Eats Here, Amazing Food and the Inspiring People Who Make It. 
at New York's Queens Night Market by John Wing and Storm Garner. Now, I can't say that I would use this as a traditional cookbook. It would require a large variety of specialty ingredients and cookware. However, I was really inspired by the chef's stories and their food. It really goes into a lot of detail about the chef's lives and how they came to be serving food at the night market. Um, it contains an array of amazing life stories. Um, the Queen's Night Market is one of the most diverse markets in the country. Um, it represents 40 different countries, different people that are come from, and a wide variety of experiences. However, all their short stories share a common thread of hardship, tragedy, and family. Uh, what brings them all together is food. And that was incredibly relatable to come together over food. Um, the food really leaps off the page in descriptions. There's photos and illustrations. Um, but it wasn't the food that I remembered weeks after reading it. It was the people. In particular, I remembered Frances Roman, whose young life started out by being thrown out by her own family for coming out as gay. And now she works at the night market with her wife and her mother, and she credits food with bringing them back together after years of separation. And that was such a powerful story. Um, another name that I remembered weeks after reading was Jeffrey Hernandez, whose family's first food stall got closed after his father sadly passed away unexpectedly while they were on a family vacation. But then as an adult, he convinced his mom that they should um, sell her food again together as a family. And now that they, they're incredibly popular at the New York Queens Night Market, and you get to read about their food and them, and it was just really inspiring. These chef stories are equal parts heartbreaking and inspiring. And this book made me think about the recipes I use and my family uses and just kind of the, the bonds that they represent. So it was really good, really interesting food and biography. Um, would highly recommend it. Those were my books. Lovely, thank you so much. I have never heard of the, the Queen's Night Market, but now I desperately want to go because that sounds so fun. The food sounds so good. It does. And then, I mean, just to like, just to even fathom something like that at this time, you know, where we're all kind of stuck where we are, it, just, it sounds magical. And also yeah. anytime you put the word night in front of market, I'm like, ooh, so intriguing. Yeah, you know, it's going to be good. <laughs> totally. All right. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. All right, I don't see any hands or unmuting. So um, I think I am next. Um, so, all right. So my first book is called White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide by Carol Anderson. If any of you are currently in an anti-racist or a racial justice book group or discussion group, um, or even if you're just in a regular book club where you read all kinds of titles, this book will for sure spark an excellent discussion for your group. Um, the author, Carol Anderson, is a professor of African-American studies at Emory University in Georgia. And back in 2014, um, which is a pretty important year, um, she wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post called Ferguson isn't about black rage against cops, it's white rage against progress. And so she then delved deeper into that idea to write this whole book, sort of fleshed it out. And the main, the main idea of the book is that white rage, quote, wreaks havoc subtly, almost imperceptibly, too imperceptibly, certainly, for a nation consistently drawn to the spectacular, to what it can see. It's not the Klan. White rage doesn't have to wear sheets, burn crosses, or take to the streets. Working the halls of power, it can achieve its ends far more effectively, far more destructively. Um, so Anderson goes back in time to the reconstruction period after, after the Civil War, and then up through Obama's election as president, because um, the book was published in 2016. And she systematically shows the reader how legislation and politics has insidiously blocked black progress at every juncture possible. 
And what I appreciated so much about this book is first that her writing style is very accessible. Um, even though she's an academic, I found the book to be very readable as a lay person. And second, that she does a phenomenal job of contextualizing these historical events and legislation and court cases um, that we hear about a lot, but that we but that we probably don't know about them as deeply as we should. Um, so, like Brown versus Board of Education, or the Voting Rights Act, uh, excuse me, Voting Rights Act, for example. Um, I think many of us are very are familiar with these, but she reaches back to these watershed moments that were supposed to help black black people advance by giving them equal footing and she shows what led up to them and how they were just relentlessly resisted by certain states um, and political leaders and the lasting damage done to this day by the refusal to uphold the laws in the way that they were initially intended. Um, it's fascinating and yes, it's frustrating and heartbreaking, but I really feel like I learned so, so much from this book. Um, and I have exciting news about this book, which is that Beaverton City Library is going to be hosting a live virtual talk by Carol Anderson, the author, in three days so that you too can uh, have an opportunity to learn from this nationally acclaimed scholar and racial justice advocate. Um, I have met her on Zoom. She's amazing. She's incredibly passionate and knowledgeable. Um, so I hope you can all join us for her talk about white rage on Saturday, March 20th at 6 p.m. Um, you can find the Zoom link at beavertonlibrary.org slash Carol Anderson. And I'm gonna try to remember to put that link in the chat when I'm done with my book talks. Um, so I hope to see, you, to see you all there if you're interested. All right, and now my second book, a little bit different, changing gears here, um, is the Resisters, a novel by Gish Jen. So here's a secret about me. I don't care for baseball or really sports in general. Um, and I don't usually love dystopian fiction. So I think it says a lot that I thoroughly enjoyed this odd dystopian novel about an underground baseball team that exists to subvert the big brother-like autocracy that's known in the book as Auto America. The world that the author builds is detailed and full and it's totally believable. It's really not that far a stretch from the world we live in now where everything is technologized and the chasm between the haves and the haves, have nots is basically the size of the Grand Canyon. So in this version of America lives a small family. There's a dad whose academic career has been made redundant by artificial intelligence a mom who's a civil rights lawyer who has dedicated her life to fighting for the rights of the economically downtrodden. And then there's a teenage daughter who just happens to have an Olympic level talent for pitching baseballs. So baseball in the novel is both a subversive activity when it's played by the have nots in their resistor league, um, as well as a symbol of sort of this all American new auto America and its reliance on performance enhancing technology, which makes the players like super, super good. Um, so this kind of skewed view of America's favorite pastime makes for surprisingly entertaining reading. Um, usually I find dystopian novels to be sort of emotionally cold. Um, and so what I really appreciated about this book is that the author centers the story around this family and the family really radiates warmth. Like they clearly love and respect each other, even though, you know, they go through the trials and tribulations that all families do. Um, and they also like are dedicated and fight for the betterment of their community, even at the expense of their own safety and their own comfort. And the author is able to highlight these really important social issues like racism, economic disparity, um, artificial intelligence and technological encroachment in all aspects of our lives, but she does it in a way that doesn't leave you feeling just empty and devoid of hope and humanity. Um, it's easy to see ourselves in the characters and to root for their victory against the opposition, whether that's that opposition comes in the form of a rival baseball team or comes in the form of an autocratic oppressive government. All right. Those were my two books. Thanks for listening.
Um, next up, we have Jill. Take it away, Jill. Hello, thank you for joining us all tonight. Jenny, those books sounded great, uh, especially uh, White Rage. That sounds fascinating. Um, so I read two books um, basically about women empowerment. The first one is Circling the Sun by Paula McLean. And it was published in 2015. I can get this. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so this fiction book is about the life of Beryl Clutterbuck Markham. It takes place in the 1920s in British East Africa, now Kenya. Beryl moved from Britain to British East Africa at the age of four. Initially, her whole family made the move, but eventually her mother and brother left the country and Beryl was left behind with her father to raise her. She grew up playing with the friends she made from the local tribe, the Kib Kibs <laughs> Kibsigis. Pardon if I pronounce that wrong. Uh, she played with boys and learned to hunt. Her closest pal was Kibi. The boys in this tribe became men when they killed a lion. There was no such equivalent for girls. This is one of the early times when Beryl felt the unfairness of her sex. Beryl was bitten by a neighbor's pet lion and survived. Following this, she was more fearless than ever. Although she wanted to run wild with the boys from the tribe, her father's new paramour wanted her to be a lady and sent her off to boarding school. She went, but she went, ran away continuously. She could not be caged. She was brought back home and her father had her work with him at the farm training racehorses. Eventually the family business was failing and the family would be forced to move and the horses would have to be sold. At least that's what Beryl was made to, sit, to think. And at the age of 17, she was pressured into marrying a neighbor so that she could have somewhere to live and someone to take care of her. She barely knew this man, Jock Purvis, and was unable to love him. He was a drunk. She was upset that her father had not yet moved, yet she had been forced to marry, and now she did not have her old home to go to. When she wanted to divorce Purvis, he wouldn't allow it, so she started training horses. Beryl was a girl who wore pants at a time when sitting astride a horse was shocking. When Beryl had great success training horses, her husband claimed it as his own to increase the value of his race horses. Beryl was the first and only female horse trainer and not yet in her 20s. She was fiercely independent. She became involved with many men, both when she was married and when they were married. The rules did not apply to her and she bewitched everyone she met. She went on to marry three times. She began a relationship with Dennis Finch Hatton, a big game hunter, played by Robert Redford in Out of Africa. Finch Hatton taught her to fly bush planes. She learned how to fly and spot big game and report their locations to big game hunters. Finch Hatton died in a plane crash on which Beryl was supposed to be. After his death, Beryl became even more determined and she became the first person to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic from Britain to North America. If you are interested in brave women carving the way for other women, horse training or flying, you will love Circling the Sun by Paula McLean. So my next book is a memoir called Daring to Drive, A Saudi Woman's Awakening by Manal Al-Sharif. Uh, this was published in 2017. Manal was born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia in 1979, the beginning of an extreme period for Islamic fundamentalism. As a youngster, she was a religious radical and kept her family in strict adherence to the laws, morals, and customs even burning her brother's cassette tapes as they were forbidden by Islamic law. Her father supported her formal education and Manal got her bachelor's degree in computer science. She was the first woman in information security hired by Aramco, an oil company, and worked on a westernized compound in the desert of Saudi Arabia. 
on the compound, she was allowed to drive in order to con conduct business. Although on a business trip, she had to take her school-aged brother as a chaperone. You see, she owned her own purple Cadillac SRX, kept it in a garage, but she couldn't drive it on Saudi roads. She could not drive her father, whom she thought was dying, to the hospital, but instead had to have her younger brother, who did not know how to drive, drive them to the hospital. On one evening, Manal had her own doctor's appointment, but it ended after dark and she did not have a ride home. She had to walk along dangerous roads to get to the mall in order to get a taxi. On the way to the mall, she was harassed and followed and she felt threatened. Men she worked with complained that they had to get off work early in order to drive their wives around. Women who worked spent up to a third of their income paying for drivers. It was absurd, and though Manal was not looking to stir things up, she found the contradictions in how women were treated to be more than she could bear. The reality was that there was no actual law that forbade women from driving. It was a custom based on morals and the religious police known as the Mut Mutawa enforced this custom. Manal started to get a following on Facebook and Twitter. Although she received much criticism, she also received lots of support. On May 17, 2011, she set up a plan to be recorded while dri driving on Saudi streets, and this video went viral overnight. Though she was wearing a hijab and sunglasses, she was arrested at her home in the middle of the night, taken away from her young son, and taken to jail. She was arrested for driving while female and interrogated and kept in a cage for several hours until she was let out. She was told she could not talk about the incident. Though the event got lots of publicity, women continued to be banned from driving in Saudi Arabia. Since 2018, however, it is legal for women to drive in Saudi Arabia, and largely due to the courage of Manal al-Sharif and the Women to Drive move movement, uh, women are now allowed to drive legally. If you like books about strong women defying archaic customs, Daring to Drive is written for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jill. That one sounds just absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and I did not know that it wasn't against the law, that it was just a custom. I did not realize that. That is really interesting. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, Jill. Um, no, Kent, Kent, you're up. Good evening, folks. Uh, I'm Kent, and it is a pleasure to be with you for tonight's event. Uh, the first book that I have for you, if I can get it centered here, is uh, titled Asymmetry, and it's a work of fiction. It was written by uh, Lisa Halliday in 2018 as a, a first novel, which is quite impressive. I was intrigued by the title asymmetry and found that the def a dictionary definition is a lack of equality or equivalence. And this theme is one that appears repeatedly throughout the book. One interesting fact is the autobiographical nature of the novel. The first section, Folly, chronicles the May-December romance between Alice, a struggling book editor, and the much older and renowned writer Ezra Blazer. In real life, the author had an affair with the famous novelist Philip Roth, which undoubtedly informed her fictional writing. The theme of asymmetry occurs frequently between Alice and Ezra. Ezra is wealthy and a household name among readers, while Alice struggles to pay her school loans and start her career as a writer. Ezra wields all the power in their relationship. His phone number is unknown to Alice, and his calls are simply announced with the words caller ID blocked. As Alice goes through the motions of her daily life, she waits for invitations from Ezra to join him at his apartment. Ezra gives her occasional writing tips, such as the advice to not sentimentalize her characters, but doesn't take her aspirations to be a writer very seriously. He uses Alice for his own ends and is slow to introduce her to his friends and family in his life outside the apartment. One area where Alice does hold the upper hand is her youth and physical vitality. Ezra is aging and dealing with increasing frailty and limitations. 
attending to doctor's appointments and the strict scheduling of prescription medications takes up more and more of their relationship. Ezra can't help ruminating on scenes from his past while Alice grows in her self-confidence and is looking to the future. Alice's life and possibilities are expanding while Ezra's life is becoming smaller and more insular. The second part of this novel is, is entitled Madness and it tells the story of Amar traveling back to Kurdistan to search for his missing brother who's being held for ransom. While trying to make a connection to Turkey, he runs afoul of both the state and immigration authorities and ends up being held against his will at Heathrow Airport. He's questioned repeatedly by the authorities in a Kafkaesque scenario, who refuse to tell him what is wrong, merely stating that they are just checking on a few things. His every action seems to arouse suspicion. They scrutinize a, an object he's wrapped in his luggage, which turns out to be the innocent gift of an abacus for a young relative. The asymmetry in this story is the contrast between the powerlessness of the individual and the heavy-handed authority of the state. Amar is completely apolitical. In fact, he's just completed his doctorate in economics. He becomes merely a pawn on the chessboard of global politics and warfare. He experiences the asymmetry of lives that are lived in the relatively peaceful West as opposed to those struggling to survive in the war-torn Middle East. One of the more intriguing aspects of this book is that it contains a novel within a novel. In the final section, Ezra takes part in a radio interview and reminisces about his past. We learn more about his romantic history of which Alice plays a significant part. From his comments, we discover that Alice has succeeded in writing a novel and that that novel is the story of Amar being held at the airport. It has always been Alice's ambition to transcend her own life and be able to convincingly inhabit the lives of others through her writing. Clearly, Alice no longer lives in Ezra's shadow, but has become a masterly writer herself. In reflecting on this novel, we all live with the reality of asymmetry in both our personal lives as well as the relations we have on a global level between countries. Hopefully like Alice, we can learn to extract the best that this experience has to offer as we grow into lives of greater equality. Now the second uh, book that I have for you is actually a, a work of nonfiction and it's entitled How to Change Your Mind written by Michael Pollan. Uh, of the Omnivore's Dilemma fame. And this book was written in 2018. The book tells the interesting story of psychedelics in the Western world. It turns out that LSD was accidentally discovered by a Swiss chemist way back in 1938, and its mind-altering properties only came to light five years later when he actually accidentally ingested some of the substance. Another psychedelic that's covered is psilocybin, which occurs naturally in certain mushrooms. These mushrooms were known as flesh of the gods by the Aztecs and were brutally suppressed by the Catholic Church after the Spanish conquest. Psilocybin was first introduced to the West way back in 1955 by an amateur mycologist, someone with a lay interest in mushrooms who worked as a banker in Manhattan, rather ironic, I think. So some of the first research with psychedelics ended up being sponsored by the U.S. government. The CIA, of course, was supposedly interested in discovering mind control applications for these drugs. Early researchers waxed enthusiastic about the potential of the drugs to change society for the better. Uh, hence the, the summer of love and, and all that back in the 60s. Timothy Leary of the Harvard Psilocybin Project was one of the most enthusiastic However, there was always a tension uh, between the scientific establishment, which wanted to have controlled double-blind experiments, and those who spoke of having mystical experiences. Once the government realized that people that were dropping acid wouldn't be inclined to work for corporations or go off to Vietnam to fight in a war, <clears throat> a full-scale uh, suppression of several decades of fruitful research into these drugs took place. In the book, the author speaks of three psychedelic trips he experienced. 
The first was with psilocybin mushrooms. The second was with LSD. And the last was rather exotic. He, he smoked venom from a, a Colorado River toad. So these trips uh, varied in their intensity according to which drug was being used and its dosage, but they all involve suppression of the ego and the ability to access emotions and memories that were previously hidden to the subject. Before each trip, the author's ego warned him of the folly of what he was about to do, but once he surrendered to the experience, he felt he gained valuable insights. In fact, one of his primary motivations was to shake himself out of uh, mental ruts he felt he'd fallen into and to explore new modes of thinking. And he felt that these experiences were successful in doing that. The final section of the book uh, describes how these different drugs work on neurotransmitters in the brain. Current research shows these drugs are valuable in treating a wide range of conditions, spanning anywhere from depression, anxiety, addiction, and obsessive compulsive behaviors. Uh, an early theory of how the drugs worked uh, uh, hypothesize that they stimulate certain parts of the brain to create their effects. But uh, researchers using fMRI scans showed that they actually depress blood flow in particular areas. Uh, and in the brain, an area that is called the default mode network, which appears to be the seat of the ego or the self, uh, is suppressed by psychedelics. This loss of the ego and, and having the notion of a separate self allows feelings of being one with all creation and access to what the writer Aldous Huxley termed mind at large, kind of a, a transpersonal uh, collective conscious experience. Currently, there is a, a renaissance of research taking place with psychedelics. Uh, I was interested to learn that the adult brain prizes consistency and efficiency. And so when we have current sensory inputs, they're, they're interpreted in terms of, of past experiences that we've had and any extraneous input that, that doesn't fall into that pattern is basically ignored. Psychedelics tend to disrupt this editing and they introduce entropy and energy, which uh, provides access to a more childlike experience of reality as it's taking place in the moment. One caveat is the importance of setting and the presence of a skilled guide. These drugs greatly enhance suggestibility and they do require a professional in attendance who can steer the experience in a positive direction if it gets off track. So, uh, so one uh, will be able to avoid the so-called bad trip. Uh, in summary, the research are not advocating for recreational acid trips, but therapy taking place in conjunction with psychedelics where the insights could be analyzed and consolidated. Uh, I think one of the encouraging signs of these research trials is that the benefits of psychedelic ath assisted therapy appear to persist long after the drug experience has ended. So those are my two books. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pete. I'd be fascinated to know what Philip Roth thought of of that book, but I think he died right around that same time. So, yeah, I, I looked him up, and he he died in 2018, I believe. Yeah. Same. Year. Maybe she waited on purpose. Okay, we have three people left. Okay, Kristen, you're up next. Hi, everyone. It's good to see y'all. It's so fun to listen to. Um, information about all these books. It gets me so excited. I have two books. I have uh, my first book is a fiction book by Hunia Yanagihara, um, and it is entitled A Little Life. When the pandemic started, I can't, I can't hold it up. It's too heavy. It's too big. It's 700 pages. When the um, pandemic started, I was um, feeling the loss of humans in my life and feeling the loss of friends and the stories that they bring and that richness. And at that, that week I was flipping through the New Yorker and they had like a list. Are you feeling the loss of humans in your life? Read these books. 
And A Little Life was one of those books. So I was able to get it from the library and I read it and it was um, exactly what I needed at that time. It was, um, I had, was having a hard time focusing, which I think a lot of people had and some people, I think Beth even mentioned, um, I was having a hard time focusing, but this book like sucked me right in. Um, a Little Life tells the stories of four friends from college as they start their adult lives in New York City. Uh, one of the characters, they're all men, uh, one of the characters, Jude, emerges as the central character. And through the course of the book, we learn a lot about his uh, backstory, which is really heartbreaking and tragic, and how that backstory presents in Jude and how that affects the um, people in his life. Um, it is simultaneously a delightful read and a really dark read, um, but it's really a delicious read. I found it to be delicious. It feels both epic, although it is honestly just about a little life. It's about one person's life, um, friendships, relationships, and how uh, those things interweave with each other and affect each other. Um, I finished this book a, a, a while ago and I still think of it often. I um, miss the characters and I think of them a lot, uh, even though it's been a number of months ago. Um, as I mentioned, the book is over 700 pages long. I, it could have been three times as long and I would have enjoyed it uh, just as much. I did never, didn't want it to end. Um, so if you don't enjoy a lot of detail or stories focused on relationships, then this book probably isn't for you. Or if you um, don't want to read about uh, hard things or tragic or dark things, this book isn't for you. But if you are looking for um, a fiction work that is compelling, even in its minutia, um, that you enjoy reading about relationships and friendships, then I can't recommend a Little Life by Hunia Yunigahara enough. Okay, and then my second book, these are kind of like um, bookends to uh, my pandemic experience. My second book is a nonfiction book entitled Laziness Does Not Exist. Um, and I heard an interview with the author on the radio. The author's name is Devin Price. Um, it's hard to get it without the shine from the light. Uh, the author's name is Dem Price and I heard an interview with the author, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and what the author was saying was like ringing true in my ears as we move um, from kind of a more lockdown into back into a normal world or back into our normal days, uh, hopefully soon. Um, this book examines the what the author calls the laziness lie or the societal, the, the constructed, our society has constructed an idea that if we're not constantly producing, we have no value. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of us buy into. Uh, I know that I do, I know that I do, and that how busyness becomes like a badge of honor. I'm so busy, I'm so important, I'm so busy. And that if we feel um, uh, like that, hard work equals moral goodness or, or worth, I guess. So um, when I heard the author on the radio, I was like, oh, I've got to read this book because I am really interested in how, what we, how we, we do this to ourselves and how as we emerge from this experience, um, we can maybe hold on to some of the quiet that maybe some of us found. Um, the author's a social psychologist and like a good social psychologist when she gets in, interested in this. Now, of course, ironically, the author has a PhD, so I don't know how lazy the author is, but I should put that out there. Um, it's not a very long book. It's a, it's a good quick read. So the author kept it, kept it, um, kept it tight. Uh, so the author researches the history, the economic data. She interviews a lot of mental health professionals. Um, and individuals who feel overworked and some individuals who've kind of changed their lives so they feel less overwhelmed by, by their lives. Um, and 
it's science-based and it is, I think it's shelved in self-help. It's a self-help book, but it doesn't read, it has some really concrete um, answers within it. And I found it really useful uh, going forward to help me um, kind of keep from feeling overwhelmed and keep from feeling overworked, I guess. So anyway. Laziness does not exist. If it's of interest to you, the topic, and you don't want to read the book, you can um, Google her name, and there's a lot of interviews. She's doing a lot of interviews right now, so you can get kind of the gist of stuff without reading it. But it's a great book, too. Okay, thanks. Lovely. Thank you, Kristen. I like how you put it that those two books, like, bookended your pandemic experience. That's really, that's really interesting. <laughs> Look at where you, look how far you've come. <laughs> All right. Um, next up we have Sandy. Hey everyone. Let's see. So I wasn't able to get my hands on the books that I am highlighting. So I cheated. So I am starting with the Thursday Murder Club. I think it might be backwards, so I apologize. Um, so this story is about a group of pensioners who live at a retirement village on the Kent coast in the UK. Um, the main characters are Elizabeth, Joyce, Ibrahim, and Ron. They have dubbed themselves the Thursday Murder Club. Um, because every Thursday they get together in the community room and try to solve old cold cases. Joyce is the narr narrator of the story. She's a retired nurse. Elizabeth is the organizer of the group. Um, she has a background in crime solving and it's her uh, friend Penny's, uh, who is an ex-detective whose cases they try to solve each week. Ibrahim is a retired psychiatrist and Ron is a retired union boss. So when an actual murder happens, it's kind of midsummer murderish because it's amazing to think how many murders could happen in this small village. Um, they decide uh, to take that opportunity to try to solve the present day case. Um, Elizabeth has some context that she is able to tap into and assist in their current investigation. Um, even the police end up um, being manipulated by these crafty oldies who will use their sneaky ways uh, to get the information they want for their investigation. And let me tell you, they are very creative. Um, as the plot thickens and the dodgy dealings escalate, it all builds up nicely and pulling the community together to thwart the bad elements. Um, I listened to this story, so it was a bit hard uh, to keep all of the characters um, straight at the beginning, but once um, I got it all straight and where they fit into the story, I really started to enjoy it, and the humor is just what I needed. Um, it's your unconventional mystery. There's lots of funny elements, but there's also some moments of sad vulnerability, um, definitely about aging, uh, which adds a whole different dimension to the novel. Um, I, and it did have a plot twist at the end, which I didn't see coming. So that was a lot of fun um, and interesting. And um, this was a debut novel for Richard Osman, who is very um, popular in the UK. He, he hosts um, some TV quiz show. Um, so I was, I was very impressed. Um, I, like I said, I like the humor um, and there is a second book coming out in September in the UK. So I don't know how long it'll take to get here. So that was my first book. My second book, um, is a small book and it's called Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Um, and it's by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. I hope I didn't um, pronounce that too badly. So this um, takes place in a cafe in Tokyo. And for the price of a cup of hot coffee, you the customer can be transported back in time. You uh, may select the occasion to see a, a loved one or revisit an event of your choosing, but the chance to sit in that one chair 
um, in the cafe comes with a lot of rules. Um, the event has to have happened in the cafe. Um, nothing you say or do as with any time traveling novel, um, you can't uh, alter the present. But the, the biggest thing to remember is that your, your time travel starts when your coffee is poured and you must be back before the coffee gets cold. The reader is introduced to the cafe through a stranger's eyes, noticing the oddness of this little underground enclave that seems to exist in its own reality. As the book progresses, you get closer and more involved in the lives of the staff who are the life force of the cafe and, you, and they form a tight bond within themselves. The story is split up into four narratives and their choices revolving around the time travel aspect. I thought each of the characters' stories were well-written and very thought-provoking in its own way. I love when a book will make me really think about um, the choices I would have made in that instance. Um, I was really surprised that I liked the book as much as I did because I don't usually go for the time travel fantasy type books. Um, but it's actually a pretty short story. It's only like 213 pages. Um, so I figured I would try it and I'm really glad that I did. Um, it was translated from Japanese. Um, I think that um, it translated very well. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. So I think you should put it on um, your radar. And that's all I have. Thank you, Sandy. I have a, I have a soft spot for, for books that take place in pensioners' homes. So I'm definitely gonna check out Thursday Murder Club. <laughs> Sounds great. All right, and last but definitely not least, we have Shannon and her Space Age chair, Space Age chair in a library. Hello, everyone. My name is Shannon. Um, thank you to everyone who shared today because I'm over here like adding these to my for later shelf because there's so many good ones that you all recommended. So I'm very excited. Um, so my books are both science fiction, but they're both very unconventional science fiction. And um, I don't typically read like traditional science fiction, but I love both these books so very much, but they're also very different from each other. And the reason I ended up reading these books is literally because the covers are beautiful and I'm very drawn to artwork. Um, so because of their covers, I happened upon them and I get to share them with you all today. So, um, so even though they're both shelved as science fiction, they stretch my understanding of the genre by proposing big questions about humanity and the universe, but using unconventional backdrops and styles. So first up, hopefully you can see the cover. It's probably flipped. Um, uh, I want to recommend This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone. Um, so it is written by two authors and they each write one of the characters. So it was published in 2019 and it breaks away from the description heavy 800 page science fiction novels that you might be familiar with. It's a very short book, which I really appreciate because I have a hard time getting through really long books. Um, it's written in um, primarily in letter format which was very surprising to me. There is um, narration as well, but a lot of the heart of the story is in letters, um, which I really love. Um, so the book opens and it just thrusts the reader into this strange reality. And it takes so long to get your bearing, which at first was difficult for me, but as I was going through the book, um, I ended up loving that about it. Um, it's intentionally underexplained and it's revealed bit by bit and leaves you disoriented. So I'll give you like a little synopsis. In the ashes of a dying world, Red finds a letter. It reads, burn before reading, signed blue. This is the beginning of a long-standing correspondence between two rivals, top agents from the rivaling factions in a war that spreads across the boundaries of time and potential realities. 
that single letter, which was meant as a taunt towards a rival, engenders a fast-paced, passionate, epic relationship that bridges time itself. A relationship that, if discovered, will threaten the very existence of the world. Why I loved it is because it stripped away from the often overstated layers of traditional science fiction and provided the reader with just enough of the backdrop to pull them into the narrative. It somehow manages to be simultaneously soft and epic, understated yet profound. It will be a narrative that you'll mull over for quite some time and probably want to revisit with a reread as I do just talking about it today. So the next book, Another beautiful cover. I wish you could, oh, there you go. There you go. So you see like an alien and you see the flowers and I love the contrast of that. And that's one of the reasons I love this book. So this is The Seep by Chana Porter. Um, it is sometime in the future. Earth has been irrevocably changed by a gentle invasion by an alien entity known as the Seep. Through the seep, barriers have been broken down, capitalism has fallen, and everything is interconnected. Humans are able to will anything into existence with their thoughts. Trina, the main character, a trans woman who was alive before the seep brought utopia to the world, has always had difficulty adjusting to this blissful new existence. She defies the seep in quiet ways like wearing her old denim jacket and her combat boots and carrying around a pack of cigarettes, even though cigarettes are a thing of the past. One day, her world is turned upside down once again when her wife uh, comes to the personal decision that she would like to be reborn again as a baby, which is something you can do in this world. So she wants to start over as a baby. She picks a nice French family to be born into, um, and says her goodbyes to Trina, our main character. So once again, Trina's, uh, the foundation of Trina's identity has crumbled and she's stricken with overwhelming grief uh, and is struggling to find anything to live for. She falls into depression and binge drinking, uh, which is basically unheard of in this new utopia. Um, so she sets off on a journey which although it is a physical journey, she's actually traveling, really the book is a journey of um, an existential crisis and a coming to terms with meaning and identity. So why I love this, um, it's written by an author who doesn't hold their writing hostage by the traditional science fiction tropes. Uh, the focus of the writing is on exploring hard questions of grief and meaning. Uh, in a backdrop of a world where everything is on the surface perfect, I really, really appreciated the diverse cast of characters and how even though this world is, this new reality is so absurd that I can barely describe it to you, we're anchored as the reader with uh, throwbacks to objects that are familiar and it helps keep me grounded in, in the world. Um, so I really do recommend this. It's very hard for me to even explain it to you, but it really just ended up being one of my favorite reads last year. Um, so thank you so much for letting me share with you all today. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, I also really like books that, because um, I don't like straightforward science fiction either or fantasy, but I do like I like books that sort of defy those genres and like cross genres and those sound really interesting and very beautiful covers. I also love that you picked them because of the covers because I totally do the same thing. We probably all do. Um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. If anyone had any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, Thank you so much for coming tonight um, and listening to us talk about books that we love. Mike, what's up? Well, Beryl Markham, um, I read Circling the Sun and I enjoyed it, but Beryl's own autobi autobiographical memoir, she wrote in the 1930s, I think it's West with the Night or something like that is the title. It's really a good book. It's very well written. Hemingway made a comment about how, how well written it was. And um, 
I, I would say actually that, that I think it's, 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 if you're only going to read one book about Pharaoh Markham, I think you're, you're better off to go with that one, certainly. Um, Thanks, Mike. That's, that's just one, my opinion. Yeah, that's one I definitely want to read. Yeah, it's really good. I bet. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. All right. Oh, Edie, do you have something to say? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, Out of Africa, is that the same story again? Is that the movie that was made from the book Mike's talking about? I think so. I, I think so. I think so. It's, it's just a related. different person, though. It's, no, Out of Africa was Isaac Denison or something? Yeah, Isaac like Denison. Denison. Yeah. <laughs> oh. She wrote stories that out of that movie Out of Africa was based on. But, I mean, they're set in the same same time period with some of the same characters in the same, place. The same real people yeah, yeah. Okay. it's right. not the same story no. okay thank you all right well i guess that brings us to the end of this oh robin i see that you raised your hand but i don't see where you are where are you go ahead robin okay I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering it, uh, with Devin Price and that laziness does not exist if she actually worked with Black feminists because they've been dealing with this concept for, I don't know, a really, 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 really long time, like decades maybe, or like half a century or more than a, close to a century, this whole concept and rest being a... Um, a social protest. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk um, about that concept with black feminists and, and social justice people that I've heard from. Yeah, the author, the author touches upon that, doesn't spend a lot of time um, on it, but yeah, yeah, the author okay. does speak to it a bit. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Thank you, library staff, for what I know is, you know, a sort of involved process for all of us, but I really appreciate it. Um, I have a lot of books, new books on my to-be-read pile, which I'm super excited about. Um, I hope you all do too. And um, I hope we'll do this again soon. So yeah, stay tuned. Have a great night. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you.